So let me introduce, uh, actually Barbara is, um, who is, uh, is here in, in, uh, in Pontedera, but she is actually with the IIT Center of uh, Bi uh, micro Microbiorobotics. Microbiorobotics, uh, and actually she is one of the four vice director of the IIT, the Italian Institute of Technology, but as you know, is a very, um, um, significant uh, research center here in Italy and worldwide. So, and she will talk about, uh, as I anticipated to this, uh, uh, apparently, um, for sure, a, a really innovative uh, idea, which is the idea of uh, uh, building plantoids. So, uh, plantoids, so robots which are actually uh, inspired by plant intelligence. And, uh, okay, I don't want to quote again Wolpert, and uh, I leave uh, the floor to, to Barbara uh, for a, a, another, I think we, we are going to have another very inspiring talk. Thank, Thank you, you Fabio, Barbara. for the nice introduction. And uh, hello to everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this occasion to present uh, some of the activities that we are performing in the Center for Microbiorobotics. As uh, Fabio said, uh, I would like to introduce the research that we are performing by mimetics and uh, bio-inspired technologies with uh, specific attention to plant-inspired technologies uh, to develop uh, distributed uh, robotic systems, but also new materials, uh, uh, actuators, sensors, algorithms, and so on. And uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, our approach uh, to these uh, uh, bio-inspired technologies. Um, we start from the biological systems, in this case a plant, as I said. Uh, so we identify first the features that we want to imitate. So the first point is to uh, identify this point and then try to translate, of course, by simplify in a technological solution for different applications, I will show you uh, later on some of the ideas that we have in mind. But at the same time, our ideas, our interest is in using the bioengineering approach to develop new tools, new setups, and new robots to quantify data in biology, so to validate a model in biology and to better understand the biological systems that we take as a model for developing new technology. But this bio-inspired approach is not new, in fact, because uh, the word biomimetics uh, was introduced for the first time in 1957 by Dr. Otto Smith, that was a polymath bioengineer, exactly with this approach to transfer ideas and concepts from nature to technology. But this approach is much more older. In fact, if you consider that Leonardo da Vinci studied for many years the fly of birds and insects in order to design flying machines, and it seems that also he designed the first humanoid, the mechanical knight, starting from uh, studies of uh, human anatomy. So this approach can be also useful, as we said also with the Rolf told in robotics, especially when the robots have to move in unstructured environments in uncertain situations. So robots have to react and to adapt to this situation, to this condition. And so biological systems in this case can provide the solution because exactly what they have to do every day to survive. So we can take many ideas for bio from biology, and uh, from a biological point of view, depending from the classification that we use, but we have five kingdoms, starting from monera, the bacteria, the protista, fungi, uh, animal, and plant. So we have uh, many ideas that we can take from nature, and in fact, there are already some uh, technology, robots uh, inspired by this uh, uh, system, for example, for Monera, the bacteria, there are groups that study the locomotion capability of this organism, especially to able to move inside uh, our body, that are based on flagella and cilia, 
And these are the, the only mechanisms available inside our body uh, when you consider environment with a very low Reynolds number, so they are adapt to our body. And the idea is to study exactly this locomotion capability to design and to develop a microfabricated robots that they move inside our body for medical application. But most of the robots are in fact inspired by animals, so you know very well. So there are flying robots, swimming robots, running robots, up to the humanoids that we already seen. Uh, and in, in the long-term perspective, the idea is to use these robots uh, as a system uh, in our uh, house or for elderly people, or also as co-workers, as we said, in industrial situation. But from a biological point of view, it's nice to observe that most of the species of animals are in fact part of the invertebrates, more than 95%, and only the 5% are vertebrates, like us. So uh, the invertebrates can offer many ideas to us, and the octopus uh, uh, robot is in fact one of the solutions taken by uh, mollusk, in fact, by the invertebrates. But up to now, there are no solutions that come from plants, and uh, in robotics uh, at least, uh, and uh, uh, probably this is because most of us uh, uh, think that the plants are quite uh, uh, passive or inert uh, uh, organisms, not able to sense, not able to move. But this vision is in fact not far from the Aristotle plant vision that is reported in the anima, in which uh, uh, Aristotle talked about the vegetative soul for plants, they have the powers of growth, uh, nutrition, and reproduction. With respect to the sensitive soul of animals, that they, in addition to that, are also able to sense, to perceive. And the humans, that in addition to that, are also they have the power of reason and thought, so they have a rational soul. So plants don't move because don't sense. But this vision is in fact completely, is completely incorrect because plants are able to move because they are in fact able to sense. They move essentially in a different way with respect to animals that move with the muscle and usually they move in a different time scale but uh, there are also very fast movement in plants. Uh, for example, the, the carnivorous plants, they have to move very fast because they have to be faster than animals that they are the prey. Uh, there is the example of the Venus flytrap, the Dionea muscipola, that they close the leaves in 100 milliseconds when a potential prey touch the tactile hairs inside the leaves. But uh, they move uh, uh, following or escape by environmental stimuli. And uh, the typical characteristic of plants, uh, they are able, uh, in order to move, <coughs> they have to grow. And this means that they continuously adapt their shape, their morphology to the environment, to the changing condition the environment. So they are very plastic. But also very interesting, plants are able to grasp, to interact with uh, other, uh, other uh, system. And uh, uh, it's a very uh, interesting. For example, the climbing plants uh, have a, a very high sophisticated tactile sensing capability. And it seems that they are also able to recognize the support that they want to grasp. For example, also other, uh, other plants. And very fascinating, plants are able to communicate. They communicate uh, emitting, uh, scientists uh, demonstrated that they are able to emit uh, uh, volatile organic compounds in order to communicate, for example, with other plants uh, when uh, they are attacked by enemy, in order to uh, implement so defense strategies like close the leaves or release poison and so on. But very fascinating, they are able to communicate with other organisms, for example, with animals. This is the example of uh, tobacco plants that when it's attacked by the caterpillar, they call by emitting these uh, uh, compounds insects 
that are the enemy of the caterpillar. And so the insect uh, kill the, the caterpillar and plants are safe. But very amazing, plants are also able to uh, communicate with, again, other organisms like fungi. So they establish uh, symbiosis with the hyphae of the fungi. And this is important because they exchange uh, uh, nutrients, uh, but also they exchange information. It seems that they use the hyphae of fungi in order to send the information and to create a sort of wood wide web uh, in, the, in the environment uh, and exchange information not only in the upper part, but also in the root apparatus. So this is something that uh, it's very interesting for us because we want to understand the communication capability in a root apparatus for developing algorithms that are inspired by this, uh, as I will show you later on. So uh, the idea is to develop a plantoid, as we, we say, uh, a robot that is inspired by plants, but in particular to the plant roots, in order to develop a robot that moves in the same environment, so in the soil, for, for soil exploration. And uh, um, we identify, to start, four targets that we want to imitate from plants to develop new technologies. The first part is the growing plant-like robots, soft sensor that we need to implement the behavior of the robot, materials and actuation, and this concept of the distributed intelligence in plants. So concerning the first point, uh, our model are in particular the plant roots. So we want to investigate this apparatus, this system, in order to uh, develop, as I said, a robot that move in the same uh, environment. Uh, why they are so smart? So roots move in a very complex environment. The pressure is very high in a few centimeters. Uh, friction is a key point, a key issue to solve. But they are so smart because they grow by addition of new material, new cells at the tip level, and then they uh, push by only the tip, so in this way they reduce the pressure needed for the penetration. In the tip they have the sensor, so they have a very high sensing capability for many different uh, um, targets, I mean for touch, so they explore by touching the environment, for gravity, for humidity, for chemicals, light and so on, many, and also very Interesting for us, as I said, is investigate the communication capability inside the root apparatus to understand how they can exchange information among the apis, among the tip of the root, and develop an algorithm that takes inspiration so we can talk about a swarm intelligence in roots. So, but this is a, a schematic view of the, of the root. So what, as I said, it's very important is this part of the root because they grow by addition cell in the meristematic region and then they elongate by absorbing water from the environment. Also very interesting is the capability to release from the tip continuously mucus and dead cells in order to create a sort of interface between the natural root and the soil, and this is very important to reduce the friction during the penetration. And this part that is called a mature root, mature zone, doesn't move with respect to the soil, so there is no friction here. So they develop these hair, lateral hairs, in order to anchor the structure to be more efficient in the penetration. So how we can translate the natu this natural mechanism in an artificial system? So what are the ideas that we can implement? So this was the first uh, prototype, uh, one of the first prototypes we developed. It's very simple. It's an hollow shaft with a soft skin inside with the lateral hairs. And this soft skin is pulled by metallic cables controlled by a DC motor that you can see here. And so the result is a movement in the soil, a penetration in the soil, like you can see in the uh, next video. So, uh, and the presence of soft hairs are very important because like in the natural roots, uh, these hairs uh, help in opening the, the soil, in this case an artificial soil, a transparent soil to observe the movement of words, and the result is a penetration in the medium. But this uh, uh, prototype is very efficient, 
because we reduce in this way the, uh, the, the friction between the external part and the roots. But we have some limitation that we need to solve, in particular the internal skin friction, because uh, the movement of the skin crea creates some uh, internal friction, and also the complex artifact design, because uh, we cannot have the sensors that are fundamental for the behavior of the robot. So we need, uh, we need uh, to investigate the secret that, uh, as I said, is the addition of new cells at the tip level, and then elongation, and the old part, as I say, doesn't move with respect to the soil. So, so this is the key point that we need to imitate. And so starting from this observation, this study, we develop the first growing robot. So this robot moves in the soil by addition of new materials, that in this case is artificial material, is a filament in polypropylene, so the new layer is added at the tip level, so it's in contact with the tip layer, and so the result, the result is that the only part that is pushing in the soil is the tip, like in the natural route. So it's a sort of a customized additive layer manufacturing technique. And uh, um, here, so the mass is changing continuously in this robot. And you can see here the, the zoom, the, the schematic view of the, of the robotic route. So the, there is a, a motor that pulls the filament that is in a spool in a, internally to a trunk that I will show you later on. And the deposition is assured by a deposition head that is driven by a gear transmission mechanism. So, as I said, the new filament that you can see here is always in contact with the deposition head. And this part doesn't move with respect to the soil. So this is a growing root, but it's not enough because the natural root, in order to follow the environmental stimulus, or to escape in case of negative stimulus from, from, from this, they have to bend. They have to circunnotate an obstacle. They have to find the better path to penetrate in the soil. So essentially our robot have to be, have to be flexible, to bend. And so, again, how to implement this capability? That in the natural route, they had more cell from one side with respect to the other side. So again, growth is the secret. And so we needed to implement these features in our artificial system. So we investigated two different mechanisms, the lateral logical fluids and DC motors mechanism. Uh, about the first solution, uh, you know the electrological fluids are very um, uh, smart uh, uh, fluids because they embed uh, fine dielectric particles. And when uh, 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 electrical field is applied to these, field, uh, to these fluids, they change the viscosity, so they become quite solid. And so we can play with this property and we can develop electrological uh, valve. So we have electrodes, <coughs> the fluid moves inside the electrodes, and when you apply the electrical field, the fluids become solid uh, or quite uh, uh, viscous, and so you can uh, close the, the channel and to have the consequent bending in the other direction. So here you can see the movie. We have three chambers and the play with these uh, fluids, so you can have uh, the consequent elongation and the bending. But again, uh, we consider some constraint of uh, the solution because uh, a fluidic system is needed and it's uh, a problem when you have uh, an integrated robot with many roots and uh, uh, many functions. High voltages are, are also required and low torque is generated and this is also a problem when the robot has to move uh, in the real soil. So we move on uh, uh, to a, a more uh, simpler uh, solution, but very effective, uh, uh, based on uh, uh, DC motor mechanism with the screw and spring for implementing this soft bending. So we can control the elongation of the spring in order to have the bending and the differential elongation of the spring. So uh, as I will show you later on, uh, we can obtain the bending depending from the stimulus uh, uh, that we have in the, in the root, in the artificial root. 
But uh, in order, I mean, uh, what is uh, very uh, important, as I said, is the behavior that uh, we needed to implement uh, in, uh, in our artificial uh, uh, robot, in our artificial route. And uh, as in the natural uh, uh, system, the behavior depends from the sensor because they have uh, 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 several sensing capabilities. So we identify just some of them that are relevant for us, like temperature, gravity, humidity, touch, that is fundamental, and chemicals uh, like potassium, pH, nitrate, sodium, phosphate. So we have a, a tip with several sensors. But the, the problem here is that for some of them, like uh, gravity and temperature, there are some uh, uh, commercially available solutions, so it's easy. They are very small and easy to, uh, to integrate. Like for gravity, we use a three-axis accelerometer, and for temperature, a digital temperature sensor. But for all the other parameters, we needed to develop our customized solution because this sensor has to be soft, to be more compliant with the soil, and very easy to integrate, very small. So we develop uh, several solutions. This is one of the solutions we develop for soft tactile sensors, in particular to measure shear and normal force. So the design is simple because it is a capacitive sensor, but the, the, the material that we use are very smart. So we use a copper thin coated textile as electrodes and uh, um, fluorosilicon as a, a dielectric layer. Uh, because of the fluorosilicon uh, uh, and the PDMS uh, in which we embed the, the electrodes uh, are not good uh, in terms of adhesion, naturally we create an air gap that increases the sensitivity of the, our sensor. And so in fact we reach very good uh, performance in, ter in, sense, in terms of uh, sensitivity. A normal force up to 30 newton and shear force of about 2 newton. And it's very sensitive because we can stimulate the soft sensor just by using natural leaves. And so it's a very uh, suitable for being embedded in our uh, robotic route. So touch, that is very important because the natural route um, try to understand, if we can say, the environment by touching. So they are able to perceive the impedance variation in the soil. So it's very important also for our robots. And uh, uh, touch, humidity is fundamental. And uh, we implement uh, two different approach. One more traditional based on metal electrodes to measure the resistant variation in the soil. The other one more mm, advanced based on, again, soft materials uh, are conductive polymers. Uh, we use these conductive polymers as uh, electrodes, again, to measure uh, electrical variation uh, in, the, in the soil. And in particular, we use a PDOT PSS, that is uh, a conductive polymer. Very interesting because it shows high sensitivity and reversible change of electrical properties when it is in contact with uh, humidity and water. And so it's a, in a very thin film configuration. And we increase the sensitivity of this uh, sensor by adding iron oxide nanoparticles. So again, we uh, embedded this sensor in our, in our tip, soft, as I said. And uh, together with a group in Spain, the IDEC group in Barcelona, they developed this very smart sensor. The, the, the size, as you can see, is very, very small. And for chemical sensors, it's a really complex task. So uh, they are based on ion-selected electrodes. And they are able to, as I said, measure different parameters, chemical parameters. Uh, very interesting for agriculture uh, application, like nitrate and phosphate. So at the end, you can imagine a route I will show you later on. Uh, with the several uh, sensor and the related behavior. So sensor, but what is very smart in plants, and this is a key point uh, from my point of view, is exactly this point. So as I say, they are able to move uh, without muscle. So by studying this property in, uh, in plants, uh, we can generate uh, new ideas that are completely different in order to create uh, new materials, uh, but also new sensors and new actuators. In fact, there are many different kinds of movements in plants. Many of them are 
active, so they need a metabolism and uh, they are based on osmosis, in fact. So, as I said, many of them are very fast because especially when in carnivorous plants, they have to eat the, the animals, as I said, so they are very fast. And the idea was to investigate this biological principle to uh, design, to develop a new class of a high efficiency and low power consumption actuator. This was the, the key point. And so starting from uh, the biological observation, we um, develop, and this is the principle, sorry, uh, the osmosis principle, that it's very, uh, the key point of our actuator. So we have a movement of, of water across a semi-permeable mem membrane from one area with a minor concentration ions to an area with a major concentration ions. And so we want to use this flux of water to generate an actuation. So this is the point. And starting from this observation, we develop a very uh, simple model to extract the, the specification, essentially, and to design and to develop our actuator. In particular, the actuation time that is uh, in uh, one minute, because consider that this is completely passive uh, actuator. And um, the, the scale is about 10 millimeter, because uh, the osmosis works very well at the micro scale. And the force, the maximum force that we want to generate this is about 20 newton. So this is the specification of the actuator. And we designed, developed our actuator in which we have two chambers, one for the water, the other one for osmolite, like sodium chloride, an osmotic membrane with the grids to avoid the deformation, and simply a bulging disk to demonstrate the actuation. So what we, uh, I mean, obtained uh, is a very simple actuator that uh, can uh, be uh, controlled by simply add the water because it's completely passive. And so in maximum two minutes, you have uh, the actuation. And so you could uh, use uh, this actuator for many different applications, for example, for release drugs or for all the application which time is not a constraint. So this is an active movement but very fascinating plants, there are many passive movements. There, are, uh, there is no metabolism involved. But the secret here is uh, in the hierarchical organization of the materials that are able to interact with the changing conditions, especially in humidity. So there is part of the material that uh, absorbs and resorbs water. And the other material, like the microfibrils, that drive the movement. And so, these are dead parts, dead organs that continue to move thanks to the material. So this is a very smart feature that we want to imitate. And in fact, we develop the first plant-inspired agromorphic actuators in which we have two materials. One is the P.PSS that, as I say, is a conductive polymer that is able to absorb and desorb the water. And the passive layer in PDMS that drive the movement. So <clears throat> what you have is that when there is water in the atmosphere, the PDMS absorb the water and you have the bending. But you can also control the movement, apply the electrical field. So there is a release of water by Jowell effect. And you have the bending in the opposite direction. So we can generate a, a different uh, a shape, a different uh, I mean, system based on this material. Like, for example, you can see uh, in these videos, uh, so we have uh, uh, flowers of uh, soft hands for manipulation and grasping uh, uh, of uh, very uh, small objects. And uh, you can see that uh, you can control by applying, as I say, the current. And so the, the temperature increases and uh, there is a release of water, but also very passive movement. So it's sufficient to, uh, the humidity around your finger in order to have a movement of the leaves, of the artificial leaves. So you have an intelligent material that you can use also for the cover of your robot to generate a new sensor, a new actuator, in a very passive way. So essentially by using the environment in order to move. And then I would like to talk uh, briefly about this point that I mentioned also uh, Fabio before, 
about this concept of distributed intelligence that it seems uh, quite, uh, I mean, uh, new and impossible for plants. But in fact, uh, the first scientists that talk about intelligence in plants were Charles Darwin and uh, his son Francis. Uh, uh, they talk uh, in, in their book, The Power of Movements in Plants, and they talk about the root tip as a sort of brain on one of the lower animals that is in fact in the soil and is able to perceive the inputs from the environment and to direct the several movement consequently. And exactly this point that we are exploring in our research. So as I said, the tip, the, the, the roots are able to perceive many different kind of physical and chemical parameters. Uh, so we want to use this property, these parameters, as an input of our algorithm. So uh, the plant, depending from the species, give a different priority to this parameter, and this is genetically established. But this priority changes continuously on the basis of the needs of the plant, on the basis of the interaction with the environment, and these represent the phenotype of the plant. So, Exactly the same in our algorithm, we have the input that are these uh, parameters with some priority. This priority changes, as I said, on the basis of the need of the robot in this case. And uh, uh, there is a memory and uh, a weight of these uh, parameters that change continuously. And the, the interaction of this aspect give as an output the growing speed, the growing direction of our route. So this is the idea, and we are uh, implementing this emerging behavior algorithm together. Uh, this part is led, in fact, by Professor Dario Floriano, and uh, uh, in collaboration also with the scientists that are investigating this uh, um, coordination capability in plants. And this is the first version of our plantoid. So you can see the material that I mentioned before, so material that are able to interact with the changing condition of the environment, especially humidity, the trunk in which there is the spool, the electronics, the battery, and the roots in which we have the sensor to implement the, the, the behavior that can be positive or negative. These behaviors are called tropism in biology. So, for example, the gravity is positive because the roots tend to uh, grow following the vertical direction of the gravity. But there are some uh, uh, also negative uh, input like the tigmotropism, so the touch, when the root is touched, they tend to move in the opposite direction to find another way to penetrate, in fact. Hydrotropism is positive, so uh, the direction is the same of the, the stimulus. And thermotropism is, is uh, considered quite negative and tend to escape. And then uh, we have the growing mechanism. So as I said, the, the addition of new materials, so, so the mass, as I said, the changes in, uh, in this robot. Uh, and the only part that is pushing the soil is uh, the tip, again, to reduce the, the pressure. Otherwise, it's impossible to move in an autonomous way in this very complex environment. But what we can do with this kind of robot? The first idea was to use this robot, this plantoid, for environmental application. Of course, depending from the sensor that you put in the tip, but in principle, you could have large areas with many plantoids that instead to move on the surface, move underground, and are able to detect in an autonomous way, uh, heavy metals or nutrients or water, radon, and so on, and send the information to operators in the field. But another possible application, uh, we start, in fact, with uh, funds from the European Space Agency, um, is a space exploration, because, of course, for the exploration capability of the soil, but also for the anchoring capability of the plant roots, because plant, the first thing that they have to do is anchor the structure and then to grow. And so uh, the angle that they generate uh, is dif different on the basis of the soil in which they move and so on. So this could be another uh, application. And in the more long-term vision, the medical application to develop uh, uh, surgical probes that are flexible, but they are also able to grow in, uh, in our uh, body. This is, in fact, an idea of the doctor that works with us, uh, with us in other field in, in the center. So they say that it could be nice to implement the idea of uh, a 
uh, route that the movement of the body because in this way we reduce the friction with the external environment that in this case are our tissue of course so we reduce the damage possibility of the tissue <laughs> and of course this is in the long term perspective so I would like to conclude with some um, few remarks uh, um, as uh, most of you know that work in this field uh, uh, transfer ideas and concepts uh, from the natural world to the artificial world is not easy at all, it's not trivial, because we need to really understand the key points that are the basis of the biological system to unveil the embodied intelligence, as Rolf many times said, of this biological model to develop robots that are really able to adapt uh, to react to a real situation, real environment. And uh, um, biorobotics is the way, because with this approach, um, biorobotics can really learn and they can really offer new solutions, both in the biological side and in the artificial side. So it's important also for the biologists that work in this way, because by using robots, by using a bioengineering approach, we can really quantify some biological phenomenon. So it's a really important as not only for real application, but also as a tool to demonstrate some uh, uh, theories, some models, as I said before. So in my mind, the robots are a sort of microscope of the future in the hand of biologists. And uh, uh, these are in particular our interests. So we want to develop environmentally adaptable growing soft robots, in particular take inspiration by plants, but not only and responsive uh, materials that can act at the same time as actuator and sensor. And so we can have, uh, as I said, a cover of our robots that are more intelligent, that can really interact with the, with the environment, uh, and in this way reduce the complexity of the, the control as well. For many different applications, for us very interesting are the green robotics, rescue space, and medical robotics. And I would like to conclude just to send this message. So for me, plants are the paradigm of the integrated design because uh, uh, they are similar function to animals, but they, I mean, uh, show different solutions. They communicate without a mouth, uh, they move without a muscle, so they have uh, many similar functions to us but they implement in a different way. So we need just to understand how they can do that without any prejudice, and uh, try to exploit this idea to create a new robot, a new technology for the future. So I would like to thank uh, my groups that work uh, uh, with me in this uh, research, the European Commission that uh, funded this uh, uh, project, the Plantoid project, the project, the partner that they are, Professor Dario Floriano from the PFL, uh, Professor Stefano Mancuso from University of Florence, and Professor Stefano um, Joseph Samitier from IDEC uh, in Barcelona. And of course, all of you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. So thank you for this inspiring talk. Uh, I think that uh, this is uh, extremely in, in line with, uh, discussion, with the concept of morphological computation and embodied intelligence that we quoted many times. Uh, I, um, I guess if there are some questions on this, since we have a couple of minutes left. Is there any question? No, I, I, have a, uh, I have a question. Uh, um, so you, you think uh, that uh, uh, Warpath is wrong? What? You know, that uh, uh, Warpath, uh, the, the famous quote by yeah, wrong, yeah. or maybe it should be ref the concept should be refined. Well, I think that we need to refine many things in, the, in this uh, field because uh, the terminology, starting from the terminologies, because uh, the terminology that we use is more uh, referred to animals. Like the classification, as I show you uh, in the animal uh, kingdom, 95% are invertebrates. 
and only 5% are vertebrates. But the classification, of course, is uh, anthropogenic, you know, it's uh, yeah. on, uh, around us. And uh, the same for plants, they are really far from us. So we needed to, first of all, to identify a, a really uh, way to investigate them. Uh, the terminology, in many cases, creates confusion because there is no way to discuss about plants uh, but you can just use the terminology that uh, usually we use for animals. And in some cases, you can create a confusion because uh, what is intelligence? If intelligence is related to sense and is related to move, is related to the capability to adapt to the environment, to take a decision about the, the situation that the change, plant is intelligent. So, um, it's a, a matter of definition and uh, for sure we need to observe them uh, with more attention because uh, they are just uh, adapted in a different way with respect to us. It's not true from my point of view that the only solution is uh, our solution. Mm -hmm. um, they are, they are represent the 99% of the biomass on the world, on the earth. So probably they are more adapted than us. To, to live in our, in our planet, but they are just different. And so we needed to observe with more attention uh, the properties of plants and uh, say that they move, they sense, they in some way take a decision if uh, we can, uh, they communicate. No? So what do you think? I think that they are intelligent. If we want to use intelligence in this uh, term, as I said, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the capability to sense, to perceive, to adapt to the environment, to, to move, to uh, change completely when the situation changes. So they are not passive. They not move randomly. So these are true. And then uh, starting from this, we need to identify probably new definition, new discussion. Mm -hmm. This is my point. <laughs> no. Okay. Now, I, I think, uh, uh, I don't know, we, we, we see my VM is slightly twisting your, your argument, but uh, uh, what I think, generally speaking, I think that uh, uh, when we say that, uh, this, uh, that robotics has also a scientific side, meaning that uh, she, she quoted uh, before, she, she talked uh, about the uh, kind of microscope for understanding biology or intelligence. Uh, actually, I think that uh, uh, it, it, this example is, is very much uh, uh, in line with that, no? because actually we are forced to e expand our idea about what uh, intelligence uh, is. So uh, it, it's true, no? because for instance, we already have, uh, uh, actually I was involved in the organization of a humanoid conference, no? which is the other end of the spectra. But if you look at nowadays humanoid, uh, they are, let's say, soft, almost soft humanoids like Roboy, for instance. No? But uh, it's clear that we still miss something very fundamental. Uh, I, I think you agree on what, uh, how really we represent uh, uh, intelligent system or machines. Mm -hmm. And also, actually, I, I, this was about soft robotics, was about morphological computation. And it was also about uh, in intelligence. So it's true, no? these plants are actually able to sense, they take decisions, they do on a different time scale that we do. Uh, we, uh, so this is maybe even too much speculative, but uh, you know that we are looking for uh, alien uh, biology, uh, biological system, uh, and uh, we even have a search from extraterrestrial intelligence. No? Uh, it's, it's possible that we, we need uh, to have a better understanding what we mean as biological system and intelligence system in that, because we may not simply see no. what's out there. No. No. Uh, I don't know what. Yeah, no, the, the problem is that very often when we don't understand something, uh, we say that it's simple. <laughs> and uh, I think that this is exactly what we are doing with plants because the plants are very difficult to, first of all, to observe. Of course, we have uh, many problems to observe the movement, in, especially in soil, and uh, also in terms of time because now it's possible uh, thanks to the time lapse so we can have uh, this video and so we, we can see that they move. Uh, but this is uh, for sure one 
problem, especially in the past, because uh, uh, without technologies it's not possible, it's, except for the very fast movement that uh, I mentioned before, it's not possible to observe the movements. The same for the soil, so we develop many tools, set up to observe this kind of uh, behavior, movement, and so on. So for sure this is the first problem, to understand plants. So they, they, they are really uh, far from us in, uh, all the, the, in all the senses. So we need to be more uh, um, open. I think that this is the problem. We need to be more op open and try to first understand, then say something about the, the system that are uh, close to us, around us. Because uh, this was the problem in the past, it was not allowed in the past, especially I don't know, uh, if you read uh, Linneo or other kind of scientists in the past, it was not allowed to say that the plants eat uh, animals. It was a very, not no, allowed. no, not allowed uh, at all. You can imagine what uh, happened at that time uh, when uh, uh, yeah, scientists, scientists say uh, that. Uh, uh, there, are, there is not this uh, uh, controversial aspect. So plants that eat animals, so it's not possible. Only animals can eat plants, no? So, and starting from this vision, uh, Aristotle influenced the uh, scientists uh, for millennium. And uh, I mean, we need to change, and now it's time to change. Okay, time to change, so thank you again. <laughs>